Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Winter 2024 Seminar in Nutritional Sciences. The theme of the seminar for this quarter is Global Nutrition Challenges and Opportunities. We've given this seminar for a number of years. This is the first time that we have got international nutrition as the main theme. And we have a very exciting program in store for you every week of this quarter. I'll begin today by talking about the global nutrition trends, asking the question, have we reached peak meat consumption? Next week, we will have a faculty member from Global Health, Dr. Yang Fang Su, who will talk about sodium reduction policies in social media. Who are the influencers affecting the public perception of sodium reduction? Then we will have a speaker from Johns Hopkins talking about building sustainable food systems in low and middle income countries. Professor Martin Blom is a world expert in this topic and we're very happy he can join us on Zoom live. Then we have two speakers from the University of Washington. Carol Levin was a co-editor of the Global Nutrition Report, giving us an overview of the progress made towards battling undernutrition in low-income countries. This will be followed by Professor Lee Anderson from the Evans School, talking about seasonal hunger, health, and climate change in South Asia. We will follow that up with a speaker from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Jonathan Gorstein was the director of the Global Nutrition Initiative for iodine supplementation. And he will talk about interventions to address hidden hunger and micronutrient malnutrition in low-income countries. Then another remote speaker from Singapore. He will not be live. It's going to be 3 a.m. in Singapore. Uh, this will be a pre-recorded presentation. Dr. Jaya Henry from ASTAR, the government research agency in Singapore, will talk about functional foods and affordable nutrient density in Southeast Asia. This will be followed by a local speaker from the University of Washington Fisheries talking about aquatic food systems to feed the world. And then the closing presentation will be given by Shelley Sandberg, also from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, talking about building nutritious food systems in Africa and Asia. So here you have a combination of academics, professors, you have officers from a major foundation involved in promoting nutrition across the globe. And we have regional speakers from Singapore and other places giving you their perspective on global nutrition. So this is going to be a very interesting program for you. Now, the way we'll do it is as follows. Each speaker will supply pre-reads and one reference, just one, to be posted on Canvas ahead of time. The slides for each speaker will be posted on Canvas, either just before the talk or just after the talk, so you will have access to all the presentations. And all the lectures will be recorded on Panopto. This room in Kane Hall is equipped for Panopto, so all the lectures will be recorded for subsequent viewing. Now, we'll be giving you some pop quizzes and reflection questions by mobile app. We want you to formulate questions for speakers. Speakers generally like to know that students are prepared for the lecture and are ready to ask questions. And if you want to dive into any topic in greater detail, if you're especially interested in any of the topics, call us, me and Noreen, and we'll be happy to point you to additional references, additional work, and additional science on any given topic. Contact us, we're there for you. So now a brief introduction about me. We'll follow with an introduction for Noreen. So I'm Adam Drewnowski. I'm originally from Poland and I was born and brought up in Poland, but I spent my time in England and Switzerland and the US and other places. So what you see here on this slide is my brief academic history. The picture center top is Balliol College, Oxford. It's actually built in the 19th century, not 14th century, like most of the Oxford buildings. Immediately below is the Rockefeller University, where I got my PhD. To the right of that is University of Paris, 
where I've been going on my sabbaticals. And then top right is my recollection of the University of Michigan, where I spent a lot of time. And it was just this snowy, snowy cold wilderness, as far as I remember. I do a lot of work in international circles. The picture on the bottom left is like a summary of our studies in Indonesia. We're do, looking at protein transition and changing dietary patterns in Indonesian islands, collecting data in Java, Sumatra, Sulawesi, and Bali. I participated in some of that, and we'll be hearing more about that work later on. Um, when I travel, one thing that I like to do is to go and take pictures of supermarkets, food in supermarkets, food in street markets, street vendors, all kinds of ways that people get food in urban or rural settings. So the two pictures here are actually not from a market in low income country. Those are actually pictures from Spain from the famous Bucaria market in Barcelona. And I'm showing this to show you that Spain, no matter what they say about the Mediterranean diet, is actually all about ham. That picture in the center bottom is all ham. And then they have beautifully produced and packaged fresh fruit, vegetables, everything else. And you have some idea of what people buy, what people eat. And these are the components of the Mediterranean diet. So I'm going to stop here and turn over to Noreen and the next slide, and she'll tell you more about herself. Hello. Yep. Um, that's me, and I'm an international student from Bangladesh, and I came here in my undergrad in Rhodes College. It's a small liberal arts college in Memphis, Tennessee. And that's me in my graduation. That's my cat. He's my roommate, and um, I pay his rent. But yeah, um, that's I'm in the graduate student program for global health, uh, masters of public health. My undergrad was also in psychology and chemistry, and um, those are kind of my hobbies. In the middle, I like making bars of like cold, cold press soaps and some like paintings from time to time. And the slides on that side and in the middle, like bottom, is a small NGO that I run back in Bangladesh. And we mostly focus on sustainable growths in local developments, uh, domestic abuse, uh, intimate partner abuse, and um, chill, like um, education to children who have uh, not had the reach of education and have been put into the workforce too early. So we pull them out and we kind of give them a space. And as for the quizzes, uh, it will be pop quizzes and it will be published in Canvas in class time. So 1230 is when it will be published. And usually they are short just for engagement purposes. Like it's not hard or tricky. It's just whether you did the reading and reflections about some of the speakers and so on. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Um, terrific, thank you. Okay, so let's um, move to my presentation about protein. There are a few things to remember. Protein is the most costly nutrient in terms of both monetary cost but also environmental cost. And this is why in high income countries, we have a number of initiatives trying to reduce the amount of animal protein we consume, and we're trying to replace it with more plant protein. I'm gonna call those alt proteins, alternative proteins, and they offer a number of promises, promises. They promise to be healthier than animal protein with less saturated fat they give the promise of improved animal welfare, lower environmental impact, equal taste or enjoyment, you may have been the judges of that, and then comparable monetary cost. So let me just start off with the first question. Oh, I don't think I signed into um, poll everywhere, so we're gonna skip that one, and we'll move on to the um, discussion of some of the things that you are probably familiar with because they're on every supermarket shelf. 
any of you are consuming plant-based milk alternatives on a regular basis? Yes? Okay, notice one thing that's worth noticing with the um, um, figure uh, or the photograph is that they are no longer using the word milk. Now they are using the words plant-based beverages or silk, but not milk because that came under regulatory scrutiny. So here you have the plant-based beverages, milks, and here you have burger alternatives. How many of you have been consuming those, have been eating those on a regular basis? You have, okay. Uh, there are also a number of new products available in Europe. Have you seen those? There is vegan shrimp, vegan tuna, and vegan foie gras, which apparently is a big hit in Spain, probably not so in France. So here you have plant-based hamburgers. Here you have alternatives to shrimp and seafood and so on, and those are being promoted in this country. In some cases, the projections are very, very positive. So notice here, according to business um, information, uh, the projections are for 139 billion in global plant-based meat sales by 2035, up from 16 billion. That's a tenfold increase practically. And then plant-based dairy sales are expected to increase to 51 billion from 14 billion, again a huge increase. But those are projections based on trends in high income countries being transposed to potential global demand in lower income countries. And this is where science comes in, and this is where you can look at economic trends and economic theories, and in fact, you are able to predict the future. Will this sustain itself or will it not? So even though we have those very optimistic projections in high-income countries, there are now some opposite voices, especially recently. Have you seen all of those recently? These are data or headlines, I should say, from 2023, which basically say that even in the US, some of the projections are optimistic, plant-based meat sales are stagnating, plummeting, fake, they're calling it vegan meat, fake meat, imitation meat, alt meat, impossible meat, and so on. So opinions clearly vary. So this is where science and research come in very useful, because then you can start looking at actual data from various places to find out what is really going on in various parts of the world. So here you have a situation from the US, and now let's take a look at situation in low and middle income countries, which are the main theme of this particular seminar. So the first big point is that what we see around us in the US may not necessarily apply to the rest of the world. That's a big point. You know, we have our ideas about the food system, we have our ideas about the foods that we like to eat, the foods that are available in the supermarket, the foods that we can afford. Those are not necessarily the same foods in other parts of the world. So this is why I selected this interesting paper for you for a pre-read. And this is a paper which was published two or three years ago and made all kinds of splash because the authors from Australia were arguing that many countries, and especially rich countries, have reached peak meat consumption. And so the only alternative in terms of their diet was plant-based proteins, that is to say plant-based milk and plant-based meat alternatives. So this I thought was a very interesting paper using a number of data sets from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the World Bank, and other places. So actually I went in, got hold of the same data sets, and did some analysis of my own. So that paper made a number of very interesting points. It's based, posted on Canvas, so some of you have already looked at it, I'm sure. And they are making the point that there is always more meat consumption with rising incomes. So diets of low and middle income countries, generally, are built around staple carbohydrates, either root crops or grains. 
cassava, yams, sweet potatoes are the root crops. Grains are going to be maize and corn and rice and millet and sorghum and some of the coarse grains and later on wheat. So here, <coughs> the paper also makes the point that the foods of the very poor are based on grains, very often with processed foods with the addition of saturated fat, added sugar, and salt. So in other words, diets of poverty globally are nutritionally inferior. They provide calories but insufficient nutrients, and things change as nations and people grow richer. What happens is this. In general, people do not consume more calories. In some cases, they do. But what happens really is they consume more expensive calories. So the number of calories is largely the same, but the type of the calories is different, and those calories are more nutrient-dense, and they're accompanied with nutrients. In other words, this is not a diet of oil and sugar and corn. Other things come in, especially animal-based foods, and especially meat. So this is a problem because calories have actually become cheap globally, nutrients have remained expensive, and this, to my mind, we can go on about it later on, this is why we have a global obesity problem. So here we have got, on the right-hand side, a graph from the paper on canvas, and you can't make out the various nations, but they are looking at consumption of meat per capita per year. This, of course, is not consumption. This is food availability, food available for human consumption. Technically, and notice that countries at the bottom consuming very little, countries at the top consuming a lot, and then some countries showing a very rapid change. For example, um, Brazil, Chile, um, and others are going way up in terms of increasing meat consumption as a function of rising incomes and rising revenues. So many people or many nations do not consume meat because they can't afford it. Other nations do not consume meat because they're vegetarian. And other countries are, for the most part, increasing their income and increasing the consumption of meat. So here, I started looking at the data, the same data that um, the paper on Canvas used. And those are data from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the World Bank. I very often use the R world in data. Google it, it's very good. They plot temporal trends and country trends for various countries. And then the World Bank also has data on food prices. So just a few things about the global consumption. So here you have the World Bank map of rich and poor countries. No surprises here. These are the data from the World Bank plotted in a very nice way on a global map scale. And you can see the rich countries include the US, Canada, Europe, Scandinavia, Australia, and other countries. And most of the poor countries are in the global south, notably in Africa. And then South America, and then there are other countries also in Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia. So you pretty much know the location of rich countries and poor countries around the globe. We'll be coming back to that. And then more maps from the World Bank and the FAO. Lower income countries are producing and consuming more cereals. So dark green are places where cereals provide more than 1,400 calories per day. So imagine if you're consuming a diet of 1,600 calories per day or 1,700, 1,400 of that comes from cereals. So it's basically it's a diet of corn and rice or both. And then when you look at animal proteins, the map is completely flipped. And what you see here is data showing that most of the consumption or availability for consumption of meat, fish, milk, eggs is going to be rich countries back to the United States, Canada in Europe, Australia, but not necessarily the global south. Argentina and Brazil are exceptions because they actually do produce and export beef <clears throat> at large environmental cost. So we started doing some work on that and um, did a comparison between Indonesia and Malaysia. Those countries are very close together in Southeast Asia, separated by 
Singapore is straight, but economically they're worlds apart. Malaysia is rich, Indonesia is poor. Indonesia is composed of hundreds if not thousands of islands, so you have population living in Java and Sumatra in big urban centers, but then you also have the outlying islands where the major source of animal protein is actually fish. Interestingly enough, Indonesia is currently rejecting fish in favor of chicken and beef. So consumption of fish is now associated with low income, rural residents, low education, large families. The diets are changing and the traditional diet of fish and rice is no longer what people want. What they really want is fried chicken, which is very interesting. So when you start looking at the comparison of Indonesia and Malaysia, you can see that in Indonesia, the bar on the left, most of the proteins are coming from plants, basically rice. Whereas in Malaysia, take a look at the blue is going to be fish, yellow is going to be chicken, then you have eggs, and then you have just a little bit of beef, but not much, and a tiny bit of pork. Indonesia does not have any pork because it's predominantly Muslim. Indonesia, paradoxically, has more beef than does Malaysia. But look at the consumption of chicken and not a huge difference in the consumption of fish. So what happens with diets which are higher in animal protein in those countries is that the diversity of animal protein actually promotes protein intake and promotes amino acid nutrition. So as you look at the diversity score in terms of the various sources of protein in Indonesia, you can take a look at the amino acid nutrition, they both go together. So take a look at the low diversity score on the left. Those are diets which are mostly composed of legumes and grains, basically beans and rice, with very little other things and some seafood in blue. But as you go to the right and you increase the animal protein diversity score by including red meat and pork and dairy and eggs, you get more protein and you get better amino acid nutrition. So this is actually very interesting because we are now looking at trying to promote plant proteins in these same countries and populations in these countries are escaping away from plant-based proteins because they've been eating those for generations and they really want more animal products and especially meat. So what's interesting here is that we actually have got two opposing protein transitions occurring globally. The one in rich countries, the term protein transition is used to denote attempts to shift our dietary patterns away from meat and milk and dairy to plant-based foods. And at the same time, lower income countries are going in the opposite direction, trying to abandon the traditional plant-based diets and consume more milk and more eggs and more dairy and more chicken. So this kind of nutritional paradox, which is really driven by um, incomes in different places. So the point here is that economic laws can actually predict the future. So if you are developing a startup on plant-based proteins and you want to export those products to India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on, take a look at the laws of economics because then you will see that there is something called Bennett's Law. As incomes rise, more food energy is consumed. As incomes rise, the proportion of starchy staples actually declines. And then what you have is that people want to replace their plant proteins with meat. So what you see here, let me just show you on the next slide. <coughs> <clears throat> this is a scatter plot of energy from carbohydrates by income. And take a look at the countries. The country, the size of the dot is the population. Take a look at India and China. And what you see at the very top is consumption of carbohydrates in Cambodia and Laos, very rice-centric countries. At the bottom, you see France and the US, much less carbohydrate. And then you have Korea and Japan. And then on the right, you have the same FAO data, but now looking at consumption of rice in Asia in kilograms per year 
and notice the rice-centric countries are going to be Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and to some extent Indonesia, but definitely not Japan, definitely not South Korea, and not China. So this is an interesting snapshot of how diets are changing and how rice is being replaced by other foods as a function of income. What is happening at the same time is that those same countries are getting more energy from animal protein, and there's a linear relationship between the amount of animal protein in diet and incomes. And this relationship here, as you see, is very strong. Again, you see the countries, you see India and China, and then you see the gross domestic product per capita, and you see some countries at the very, very top where consumption of animal protein is not really linked to income anymore. But those countries are making different decisions. Most of the world on the left side of the graph is actually going towards more animal products and more animal foods. So <clears throat> the next big point is this. The availability of grains and meats follows country incomes. So these are my own analysis of the data showing that as countries become richer, these are not deciles of incomes from the World Bank, notice that the lowest income countries are consuming cassava and yams. As incomes go up, cassava and yams are abandoned in favor of maize and potatoes, and then you get to the rich countries, and you just have white potatoes, and the consumption of yams and cassava is pretty much zil, nothing. And then on the right side, you see again the substitution. You go from um, uh, what's called coarse grain, sorghum, millet, maize, rice, towards rice and wheat, and then wheat. So this actually raises some interesting questions. You know, would you want to promote the consumption of millet snacks in India? Because the economic trends are telling you that India is going away from millet and India is going towards wheat. China is moving away from rice and China is moving towards more wheat. Africa, however, is moving away from cassava and moving towards rice. So if you're actually working for a big transnational company, these are the kind of data that you have to know about because you can make a billion dollar mistake if you play your cards wrong. And then the same thing is happening with um, meat. And what's interesting here is we always talk about beef being not sustainable. But beef is not the problem because the lower income countries that are consuming more meat are not going towards beef. On the contrary, they are going towards chicken and pork. So beef has nothing to do with that. Take a look at the data by deciles of income. You go from lower income to lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income. The consumption of meat explodes, but it's going to be poultry in yellow and pork in pink, and not so much beef and definitely not sheep. I think sheep is more characteristic of the lower income groups. The data on the right are for Vietnam, and take a look at beef, not going up, slightly down. Huge amount of chicken increase, but mostly Vietnam is all about pork. So it's not meat, it's not beef, it's other types of meat. So again, you need to distinguish between the different types. And then the final analysis I did pretty much replicated what the um, um, paper on canvas showed when I plot incomes and plot countries by level of income, I do see the same leveling off of meat consumption for the richest countries with gross domestic product of $40,000 and above. But that's a handful of countries, maybe 10, and the rest, 150 countries, are pretty much going to be towards the left side of the scale where consumption of meat is actually directly linked to incomes. So take a look at the logarithmic um, graph on the right, basically you see a straight line linking gross domestic product with the consumption of animal protein. So what does it say about our efforts to limit animal protein consumption globally? I would say that we're seeing this peak meat consumption 
for a handful of rich countries. And my graph here is like a mirror image of the graph in a paper on, the, um, on canvas showing that for some countries, US, Canada, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and so on, Germany perhaps, peak meat consumption may have been reached, and those are the countries which are promoting plant-based proteins big time. On the other hand, peak meat consumption has not been reached by any of the countries on the left, and the question then becomes, will those countries be receptive to products made out of soy or lentils or millet to replicate the protein that they are really striving for, and which is really aspirational. So the question is this, can you predict the future and can you predict the success of various types of policy initiatives? I was interested in this one because the Dutch government, take a look at the bottom right, recently proposed that the ratio of plant protein to animal protein in the Netherlands ought to be 60-40 in favor of plant proteins. But take a look at the ratios which are calculated for you. In France and the United States, it's actually 37 to 63 or 36 to 64. In fact, two thirds of the proteins we consume are animal proteins. The Dutch government wants to go in the opposite direction and have a 60-40 split as opposed to 67-33 split. Will it happen? I say it won't. Because here you're looking at the only place which actually has got the 60-40 ratio right now is China. And also you can see the 60-40 ratio for the world blending together countries which are lower income, middle income, and high income. So the average for the world is 60-40. But the Netherlands is a rich country. Can they go backwards? I don't know. It's actually very interesting. Now, what about <clears throat> burgers? You know, as I said before, the trends are not towards beef and maybe not towards imitation beef. The trends are towards pork and chicken. Will the Impossible Burger sell in Vietnam where the current population trends are for pork? Hmm. What about China, where pork is absolutely overwhelmingly the favorite? So will you be selling Beyond Burger in China? I have my doubts. Another example here, Eat Lancet Diet is something that you will come across. That was a proposal for a plant-based diet for the world, and the Lancet Diet was 88% protein-based in terms of calories. So only 12% of calories come from meat. And notice here, the restrictions on meat are very tough. You get seven grams, seven grams per day of pork, seven grams per day of beef, a bit more chicken, 29 grams of chicken. So this is really very low in terms of meat consumption. This is a plant-based diet for the world. And it's really based around vegetables and fruit, but also huge amounts of grains and also root vegetables, potatoes and corn and so on. The problem was that this diet was for planetary use. Rich countries and poor countries are alike. We can come back to that issue. It was found not to be even affordable for the global poor. So here you have a number of potential initiatives about taking advantage of peak meat consumption, trying to reduce the amount of plant, the animal proteins in the diet and replace them with plant proteins. And I'm saying that those initiatives may work in rich countries that may have reached peak meat consumption, but the rest of the world really has not. And so um, there's gonna be one theme that's gonna be coming up in this course, and that is this issue of household incomes and diet quality, because we're looking at lower income countries, but nothing is static. Lower income countries are getting richer for the most part, some aren't, but most are, and their diet will be changing and evolving. And it's worth to knowing where countries came from, where they're going, and how global nutrition is changing and evolving. So just to summarize, 
um, have we reached peak meat consumption? I would say in rich countries we have, but this is in a handful of very rich countries. The rest of the world will not reach peak meat consumption for the next several decades. Um, and so as a result, currently the various plant-based proteins that are aimed for export to lower income countries are pretty much a non-starter, in my opinion. But you may have different opinions based on what you've read and what you know and the type of data sets that you have. Um, so I'll be very happy to answer any questions on this actually interesting and provocative topic. There is no single right answer because, as I say, billions of dollars are riding on the answer because every company in the world would like to have some handle in, on in plant-based proteins. Because at the same time, you know, livestock is labor intensive, environment intensive, and perhaps not sustainable in the long term. So what to do? It's one of those interesting problems. There's really no quick answer and no quick solution, but as I say, we'll be talking about those issues later on in the quarter, including fish farming, aquacultures, <clears throat> and other aspects of affordable nutrient density. So any questions? <clears throat> questions? Yes, go ahead. I don't know one of the scatter plots you showed relating the uh, income versus how much animal protein. Yep. Um, it showed that some Pacific countries, I believe Vanuatu and uh, Kiribati, those were outliers on the bottom left. Why is that? On the bottom left, they were th these were the lowest income countries. Yeah, they were lower income countries, but they were eating diets similar to. In my study or in a study of, um, that's, that's, that was on uh, Canvas. The study on Canvas looked at um, changes in income. And they did not really look at the high versus low income. They were looking at diminution of income and change in meat consumption. So in most cases, as countries become poorer, and some do, they consume less meat. That's true. Meat is more expensive than grains. But in, the, in that particular case, they found that changes in income in rich countries made no difference. So in rich countries, the consumption of meat was not tied to incomes, but in poor countries, generally it was. There were some countries, for example, like Madagascar, which are poor and becoming poorer, Ethiopia, which is poor and becoming poorer, where those relationships are kind of very unstable. Again, remember, those data are not consumption data. Those data are data from FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, on food availability for human consumption, and those data are contributed by ministries of agriculture to FAO annually. Sometimes those data are not contributed correctly, or some, some things are not there. For example, um, Arab nations have not been contributing any data on the consumption of pork. So those data don't exist. And yet other countries are consuming plenty of pork, we know that, but for some cases there is like a gap in terms of data. That's a great question, thank you. Other question? <clears throat> More questions? Yes? Um, thinking back to the very beginning when yep. we were talking about <clears throat> dairy versus non-dairy yep. beverages, are there similar studies based on like um, GDP versus consumption of dairy versus non-dairy No, no, there aren't, because there are no data from FAO on this topic, no. There are some data based on our own studies here in Seattle showing that the consumption of plant-based beverages was actually associated with higher education. Yes, it was. Not necessarily higher incomes, but higher education. Education is really the most predictive factor in terms of diet quality but the uh, consumption has not reached the level where it would show up in national databases. So we have nothing. I did a study showing that most of the plant-based milks, which is another story completely, fall into the category of ultra-processed foods given the current NOVA classification because mostly the protein is coming in from soy protein, soy isolate, and pea protein. This is also the case for um, the plant-based meat alternatives. It's actually soy and pea for the most part. Uh, but I, I'm on the lookout for that because it's a very interesting issue and no, there's nothing, there's nothing on the topic right now in a global databases, no. Great question. 
always out for the, you know, trends. I've been following the commercial databases uh, and marketing data to show me what is, is the market growing, is the market not growing. For plant-based milks, it is growing. No question about it. Great success. For the foie gras, I'm not sure. I was kind of a bit shocked. They have this kind of foie gras from soy. It's weird. <clears throat> okay, not a big market. Yeah, not, not many people eat foie gras. Yes. Yes. Ah, oh, okay, keep going. Do you think that's because, like, that's more where, like, it's dependent on where the crops can grow? Do you think that's because the country being mature more, or do you think it can swap just based on Ah, no, that, you're absolutely right. There are geographic differences historically in the type of carbohydrate in different countries. So you have, for example, cassava and yams in Africa obviously rice in Asia, and then potatoes in South America. But there's been kind of global blending of the various things. And, but there is also a hierarchy, which means cassava is actually not a nutritionally interesting crop. It has to be soaked to remove cyanide, big mess. So when people want to stop eating cassava, they want to move to the next crop, and in Africa it's rice. But in China and Asia, rice is giving way to wheat. So there are always going to be changes and you know, evolutions in terms of the preferred carbohydrate. But geographic location historically absolutely determined everything. Rice was never traditionally cultivated in Africa. Now it is. That's exactly correct. It's actually very interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> More questions? Yes, go ahead. Speak up, though. I didn't quite hear that. Keep going. Yell. Fish? Okay, so fish in lower income countries, especially in the islands, was the traditional source of high quality protein. So we did a study in Indonesia because we thought lower income people would be deficient in lysine or various amino acids. And much to our surprise, we found that the lower income populations in the islands we're still consuming the traditional fish. But at the same time, upper income people with education, graduate education, wealth, and so on, single, living in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, or in Indonesia, in Jakarta, were not eating fish. They were eating eggs, and they were eating uh, you know, omelets, fast food, and fried chicken. So it's very paradoxical, because you think that fish will be very nutritious, and combination of fish and rice is, you know, sushi. What could be better? That is not what the population really wants to eat over there. I was actually very surprised, but at the same time, I always say you have to respect what people want. I can't come in there and say, eat this. Oh my God, no, that would not be right. You've got to respect what people are eating because they're making the best choices for them, and they've considered the various options. So all we can do here is to do a study and outline the patterns and then think of potential reasons for those patterns. All I can tell you is that the diets in Indonesia of the upper income educated classes in urban centers are now very different from what you might see in the outlying islands. And again, the islands will be different in terms of income. Like Bali is rich, Sulawesi is very poor. So again, and then Bali is Hindu, Flores is Catholic, and other islands have different religions, so the combination of beef versus pork versus chicken, it's not for everybody. So again, I think this is a very important point to make, is that the preferences change depending on population, but also religion and culture and so on. So this is part of this class. We're going to be delving into deeper into various choices that people make. It's not one solution fits all. And that's why I'm kind of impatient with the Lancet diet, which tried to impose the same diet for the world. No. There's more to it. Okay, thank you so much. I'll let you go. Next week, we're going to be talking about salt reduction patterns and salt reduction initiatives as done by the World Health Organization and other public agencies. Thank you.